Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Fielding. I'm head of the Employment, Labour and Equalities team here at Gowling WLG in the UK, and I'm delighted to welcome so many of you to this, the fourth and final in our series of webinars, uh, which are our mid-year review. And we take stock of what's been going on in the world of employment law and look ahead to what's going to happen, um, in our view, uh, in the future. And we really hope that come 2022, we may be able to see you in person. But for now, we're still stuck in our, well, in my case, attic and in Jonathan's case, his dining room. Uh, and um, the topic today is also very relevant to all of us during the pandemic. We've never been more reliant on the so-called gig economy uh, and the workers that work in that uh, loaded term there, which we will find out. Um, and, you know, they've been keeping us supplied during lockdown, whether it's you know, restaurant closures and food deliveries or Amazon deliveries, whatever it is, they've absolutely been very much at the forefront of everybody's minds. And they've also been keeping the courts busy too. So there's been the Uber decision, Deliveroo, there's a DPD case going through the, the courts at the moment. Um, so there's lots of activity in this area. And interestingly, uh, like the sort of disruptors in the equal pay world uh, 10, 15 years or so ago, it's been an independent union, not the traditional unions, the IWGB, that's been responsible for many of these cases. So what does all this case law mean for the future and for your workforce strategies? That's the question for today. And our speaker, who's going to answer that question um, for us, is my friend and partner, Jonathan Chamberlain. He's going to speak for about 25 minutes, uh, answering that question. And then we'll have time, as usual, at the end, about 10 minutes for your questions before we close the webinar at 11.40. If you do have a question, then please use the um, Q&A function. If you're not familiar with Zoom, it's at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Uh, it's set so that only uh, we can see um, those questions, not other attendees. So don't worry about posting anonymously. It will only be us who see who it's coming from. And that will be helpful to us because if we don't get to all of your questions, uh, in the webinar, we'll be able to come back to you separately afterwards, so they will all get answered somehow. If you have any tech issues, then again, please use the Q&A function, and Susie Barnes, who's helping us behind the scenes with the tech, will come back to you and try and sort that out for you. And at the end, uh, we will be sharing a short questionnaire um, for feedback, and we'd be really grateful if you could fill that in. Um, I'll flag it again at the end. Um, but finally, the only other thing I wanted to say is Jonathan is... Um, taking a slightly different approach to slides from the previous speakers, for those of you who've been on the other webinars. Um, but don't worry about scribbling down as if you're in a university lecture. Um, it is going to be recorded and there's also a transcript available. So that will be circulated um, in due course. So you'll have um, all of Jonathan's words of wisdom uh, that you can look at at your leisure then. So I will go mute and I will hand over to Jonathan. Thank you. Um Funny you should mention university lectures and notes. Um, do you ever have that dream that it's the night before your university finals and you haven't revised and you don't know anything? And you wake up in the middle of the night with that fear in your stomach. Jane, do you ever, do you ever have that dream? <laughs> I haven't had that one, but I am now living to regret telling my kids who are now at university that in one of my subjects, I never went to a single lecture. That keeps coming back at me now. Yeah, well, I, I, I do get that dream. Um, I don't think I'm the only one. I hope not. Um, and I was taken back to my university finals. So imagine the late 1980s, uh, a young man who looks a bit like me, but is slimmer and has brown hair, sitting in a drafty examination hall, turns over the paper, and there in the final examination for the labour law section of the law degree is a question. And it says, the fiction of the individual bargain is the cornerstone of English labour law. Discuss. Right, I know this one, I can do this one. 
I've got to spend the first bit of the essay talking about how um, labour law, employment law, used not to be about labour and employment law at all. It used to be about the law of master and servant. And that's interesting because that was about status. Who was the master? Who was the servant? And the practicalities of the law were not really on the rights of the servant, but the rights of the master. How often was the master allowed to beat the servant? That kind of thing. Sometimes when I come into the office, um, I wish it was still like that. Um, but that's one reason why Jane is team leader and I'm not. Um, and then the law sort of updated and, and it became about a contract of employment an economic bargain. There was no longer this hierarchical relationship. It wasn't about status, it was about economics. The problem is with the law of contract is, as I've also learned from elsewhere in my law degree, that the law of contract is based on two men, always men, in a field in the 18th century, and one is buying a horse off the other one. And that is the basic construct of the law of contract. And that doesn't really fit with the employment relationship. That's, it's not a one-off transaction, it's an ongoing thing. And this 18th century idea of what the relationship is like has never really worked. And then what was supposed to happen as I wrote my essay uh, was, remember this is called the labor law paper. I was then supposed to go off and to talk about trade unions because in the 1980s, trade unions mattered. Um, and, uh, or at least we could remember the 70s when they definitely mattered. Um, but nowadays, I, I wouldn't talk about that. I would talk about Uber, and I'd talk about Deliveroo. In 1988, Uber was a word that only occurred in German, and Deliveroo is a piece of nonsense. Um, but now, they uh, offer fundamental insights into the way that employment law is structured. Now, some of you may be thinking, hang on a minute, I haven't come here for a university lecture. I haven't come here for reminiscences. Um, I want some practical answers as to how we can structure our workforce in the light of what appear to be some very complicated cases. And I'm going to come on to that right away. OK, um, I'm not going to make you wait for the end before I, I offer that. The next bit of, of this webinar is going to be what are the practical implications of the Uber and the Deliveroo decisions? I find it easier personally to understand those decisions and to see which way the law is heading if I appreciate that the theoretical underpinnings of the law have changed radically. And that's one reason why this webinar I'm giving now is very different to talks which I've given before. I can't see at the moment who's on uh, uh, the, the webinar. Some of you may even have, have, have seen me give a talk about employment status and I held up a, a jug of water and I poured water in one or the other and I said well it's just like you keep adding water to the jug and then it overflows and that's when you've got your answer. Forget all that okay the, 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 the way we think about this has now changed radically. So after I've talked about what the practical implications are I'm then going to come on to um, a bit more about the cases themselves. First Uber uh, which uh, is, as we expect for a Supreme Court decision, the touchstone for understanding this area. But then I'm going to talk about the Deliveroo case. The Deliveroo case uh, came out from the Court of Appeal as a birthday present to me on the 24th of June. Of course, after we'd sent out the uh, invitations for this webinar, and after we'd planned what we were going to say. So thank you very much. Uh, Lord Justice Underhill, I really appreciate that. Um, and on the face of it, the Deliveroo decision departs from the Supreme Court in Uber. And that is confusing. And I want to uh, set that apparent divergence in context so that we can then look back and see what actually the direction of travel in the law is, because that itself will have practical implications for workforce structures going forward. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to start off with the practical, and then we're going to go on to a bit more of the background so we can understand how things are going to be going in the future. Right, okay. So what uh, is the practical implications? 
Um, I think there are three, as, as the way the, the law stands at the moment. Um, the first is this. The written contract between the engager of labour services, the employer, for want of a better word, and the performer of those labour services, the worker, the employee, is now not nearly as important as it used to be. Indeed, as turned out to be the case in Uber, it might even be irrelevant. That's the vital change to appreciate. We're not focused on contract anymore. We're focused on statute and the purpose of statute. What does that mean practically for you? It means that thinking that you can achieve a certain result, that you can stop the providers of labor services by being workers by clever wording in the contract is not going to work anymore. All those thousands of hours, those tens of thousands of words, contracts that thick for like drivers um, between an individual driver and a Dutch corporation. Gone. You have to look at the reality. So my second point is, how do we understand what the reality is? And here's a bit of shameless self-serving. Um, all that money you would have spent on lawyers drafting your contracts, now spend it on lawyers getting to know your business. Not just a briefing from uh, uh, the HR team or the general counsel, but actually coming into the business, speaking to the ops managers, speaking to the people who are delivering the services, maybe even spending a day in their shoes, trying to work out what is really going on because it's that kind of factual analysis which will give us the answer as to what is the status of the provider of the labor services are they a worker are they an employee are they self-employed so that's my second practical point this is now all about analysis not about drafting what is the third um uh, uh, practical takeaway that, that I'd like you to have from this. Well, um, the Deliveroo case may have opened up what I think, I might be wrong about this, but what I think is a brief window before another court shuts it at some point, which I think is quite likely, we'll come on to that, that uh, our old friend in these cases, the substitution clause, still has a bit of life in it, provided that substitutions actually happen. You may recall, uh, as I said, particularly if you've heard me talk on this, this topic before, that one of the things which was a factor in influencing what was the, uh, uh, the status of the individual was whether they had to perform the services personally or whether they could send a substitute. And, and what you therefore had in, in contract after contract was a right of substitution. And that right was often qualified. The person has to be approved by us. They have to be um, uh, available at certain times, comply with certain things, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a right of substitution in there. And in the Pimlico Plumbers case, um, uh, the uh, Supreme Court said, yeah, well, there might as well be a right of substitution, but if it's never used, then, you know, really, you need to look at the reality of, of, of what's going on. Um, well, as we'll see in a moment, we come to discuss the background. In Deliveroo, um, some of the delivery uh, riders um, did engage substitutes. Not many, but they did. And the fact that that was a, a substitution clause which was actually used completely defeated the idea that um, these people could be workers because it completely defeated the idea of personal service, which when we look at the slide that I'm about to put up in a moment, you will see is key to the concept of, of, of worker. Um, now, uh, the, by various quirks, um, 
the Uber decision came out after the relevant key finding in um, Deliveroo, and that wasn't being appealed to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal said, look, maybe at first instance, had Uber been there, we wouldn't have got to this result, but we are where we are now. So if you've got a substitution clause in the contract and the substitution actually happens to a degree, then that at the moment might be enough to uh, uh, maintain the status of the providers of labour services as self-employed. So that's the third practical implication that, 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 that I want you to take away. They are, in summary, big long contracts are a waste of ink. What matters is the reality. Do the analysis, look at the facts on the ground. Uh, look who's got the power in the relationship. We'll come on to that in a moment. And, and then substitution clauses might be helpful if they're actually used for a bit longer. Okay, Jane. Before you, move on, um, you talk about ripping up the, the contract and focusing on the reality. Um, would you extend that to the usual sort of indemnity that everybody's been drafting forever saying, and if we're wrong on your on status, you indemnify us, worker, uh, for getting that wrong? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I never thought those clauses worked, not least of which because there's an express statutory prohibition on contracting out of the relevant rights. And indeed, that express statutory uh, uh, provision is referred to in the reasoning in Uber. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the reasons they say why all this elaborate contractual stuff doesn't work is here is this express provision on contracting out and here this is one of the reasons that the, the, the judges said in or in in uber why you have to focus on the statute and not the contract because the statute says you can't uh use contract to alter the rights um and and i've always had other concerns about those clauses um i think anyone who's still got one um and anyone whose legal team has been involved in drafting them needs to think very carefully about them from an ethical perspective, because they don't work. I don't think there's any reasonable chance that they would work. And as solicitors, we get into trouble for abusing our position as solicitors. And, and if a lawyer has drafted a clause which says that um, uh, you indemnify us if we're wrong about your worker status, um, you know, we're we're solicitors, the company's huge. We're talking about drivers um, who aren't paid very much at all. The imbalance there in power and the potential abuse of power by the lawyer writing words which they know don't work or should know don't work, that could get us into some ethical difficulties. So, yeah, I mean, you know, don't just rip that clause up, soak it in lighter fuel and set light to it. Okay, get rid. So, um, if those are the practical implications, let's now talk about the background. And here I want to show you some law. There, good. Hopefully it won't now move on automatically because I've clicked far too many things, but but let's let's let, let's go with that. Right. What is up in front of you is some raw law. Okay. This is actually uh, um, uh, Section 203 of the Employment Rights Act. Um, this is the battlefield, okay? This is Flanders. This is territory over which the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, the Prussians, the Germans, the British have been clashing forever. Okay, only of course in this case, it's not Flanders and it's, it's, it's not national armies, it's plumbers, it's, it's delivery drivers, it's couriers, it's car washers. It's all about this. Not necessarily this particular piece of legislation, this type of language turns up in various points in the legislation, as we'll see in, in, in Deliveroo case, which is a case about union recognition um, in a different statute entirely, but the concept is the same. This is the definition of worker, okay? And in particular, limb B worker. We're looking at B, paragraph B. Um, 
in this act, a worker, da 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 da, an individual who has entered into or works under, da 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 da, any other contract, whether express or implied, and if it is express, whether in writing or other, and here's the important stuff, whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform personally, remember that one, any work or services from another part of the contract whose status is not by virtue of the contract, that of a client, customer of any professional business undertaking carried on by the individual. Okay. That language, Lim B workers is what all these cases are about. Is the is the contract the relationship um, one of personal service undertaking to perform work personally, and where the status is not under the contracts that of a client or customer of professional business? Uh, okay, so that's what uh, all the cases have been about. Now, that's our battleground. What happened in Uber? Well, the Uber case is, is really interesting. I mean, many of us have been using Uber um, uh, uh, for, for years. Um, and uh, Uber's business model, to a large extent, uh, I mean, they would say it's built on flexibility. Da, da, da. And it's, it's mainly about arbitrage on national insurance rates, actually. Um, they save a fortune uh, if they don't have to pay um, uh, NICs in respect of um, uh, workers. Um, but it's also about all the other benefits that uh, uh, accrue to on, uh, with worker status, in particular, holiday paid leave. If you've got thousands and thousands of drivers, which Uber has, these are big chunks of money, okay? And Uber has fought tooth and nail. Uh, it lost in the Employment Tribunal. It lost in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Interestingly, what it said at this point was, we're not going to concede worker status to all our drivers because we've changed our contracts. And this only applied to uh, a few drivers at this particular time. They lost in the Court of Appeal, and then they came to the Supreme Court. And they really lost in the Supreme Court. I mean, really, really lost. Um, uh, they, their central case, which is this is all about the contractual relationship between um, the driver and the passenger. And Uber Beve um, in, in Amsterdam um, merely acts uh, as an agent to introduce the passenger to the driver and the driver accepts the private hire. And the Supreme Court says, well, just before we get on to all these interesting considerations about work status, your contractual argument is absolute rubbish. They don't use those words. Um, but what they said is, under the law regulating minicabs in London, basically, the only people allowed to accept bookings from passengers to have are licensed minicab providers. Your drivers are not licensed minicab providers, are they? So your case, Uber, would make criminals out of all your drivers and indeed you. So that can't be right, can it? There must be a presumption that whatever arrangements you've got in place are operating lawfully. So even before the Supreme Court got on to do the analysis they're about to do with you, Uber had lost, and it's all those fancy arguments, all that contracting with a with a with a with a Dutch Bay Vey and all this sort of you know nonsensical idea that the the the, 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 the drivers were independent contractors contracting with the passengers. It, it just blown out of the water completely. And an Uber at that stage, if they ever thought they were just going to be able to redraw off their contracts in a different way, that was finished right from that point onwards. There is nothing for Uber in the Supreme Court judgment, nothing at all that gives them any comfort about their business model. And that's even before we start the next bit, which since, unless you operate a minicab business in London, um, is the interesting bit for you. And, and that is this. 
Um, we'd all approached these cases before, remember me and my jugs of water, on the basis of working out what the contract was. Remember that reference that, that, that I put up in the slide a moment ago? It does refer to any other contract. So let's look at the terms of that contract. The Supreme Court turned that on its head. They said what you look at is not the contract, but the purpose of this statute. They looked at a case called, another Supreme Court case called Auto Cleanse and Belcher. And this was about people washing cars. It's another employment status case. And this is the one where the Supreme Court said, look, it's not enough just to look at what the written contract is. You have to look at what the reality of the relationship is. Remember that, that I mean, you know, the, 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 those two men in a, in a field buying and selling a horse, not really um, uh, consistent with the idea of an employment contract. Well, also Clens didn't actually mention two men in a field with a horse, but that's basically what it said. In employment cases, you have to look at the reality um, and uh, the, the Uber's case was, yeah, yeah, but also cleanse, you only look at the reality where the contract isn't clear. And the contract is clear in our case, you know, here is page and page and pages. You've got this Dutch company, you've got the individual, there's lots of, you know, everybody knows what their contractual positions are. And, they, and, and, and this is what the Supreme Court said, the, the bit that I've highlighted. The primary question is one of statutory interpretation, not contractual interpretation. So we start with looking what the purpose, what the words of this statute say, and what the purpose of this statute says. And as I mentioned a moment ago in reply to Jane's question, this statute has language which says you can't contract out of this. So the emphasis is very much on the reality. What is the uh, the purpose of this statute it is to protect vulnerable workers vulnerable people where there is an imbalance of power and there's paragraph after paragraph in the supreme court decision detailing the control that uber had over the the, the drivers and the lack of control the drivers themselves had they can't negotiate rates if they don't take on drives they get penalized and um, they have to conform to certain standards etc 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 and um that was enough more than enough to found that central imbalance so we're looking at, at, at power now not contract not words but what is the reality of the power in the relationship and that gave me my first couple of practical implications for what it is that we, we need to do. Not rely on fancy drafting, but look at how things are actually working on the ground. And really, I would have thought that was maybe the last major clarification that was needed on employment status, that this case was intended to be definitive, the last word, if you like. Then came the Deliveroo decision. And I, I mentioned uh, a moment ago when we were talking about practical implications, that what we are concerned about is um, uh, here a substitution clause that was actually used. Um, to give you some background to Deliveroo. Um, this was an application by the Independent Workers um, of, of Great Britain Union that, that Jane described for union recognition in relation to delivery riders in London. And the case goes not through the Employment Tribunal, but to the Central Arbitration Committee, which is chaired by a judge, uh, her honour, uh, Judge Mary Stacey, she was then. And only workers, broadly speaking, and employees can, can apply for union recognition under the scheme. If these people are self-employed, um, Deliveroo's case was, you can't have a union of self-employed people. What's really interesting 
is that um, as proceedings were going on, the union had applied for recognition, Deliveroo introduced a substitution clause into its contracts with the riders. Because the idea of substitution, as we've seen before, is can be fatal to the idea, or up to now has been fatal to the idea of personal service. If you can put somebody else in, it's not personal service anymore, it's not personal to you. And here's the key finding that I've put on screen from the Central Arbitration Committee. The central and insuperable difficulty, they say, is that the substitution right is genuine. Drivers have a right to substitute themselves. There's evidence of it being operated in practice. And there's one witness um, who, who said he was, he was subcontracting for a 15 to 20% cut when he went on holiday. Now, um, that uh, uh, was the position found by the Central Arbitration Committee. Um, the union had also said, look, we have these fancy definitions and things. We have a human right. Article 11 of the convention incorporated into English domestic law. We have a human right to organize as a, as a, as a trade union. And they appealed, not on the findings of, of fact about uh, substitution made by um, uh, uh, Her Honor Judge Stacey. They appealed on the Article 11 grounds. That went off to the Court of Appeal. And what you've got in the Court of Appeal is um, not a discussion about applying Uber to substitution clauses, which could have been quite helpful. What you've got is this really sort of, whoa, highfalutin theoretical case about, about human rights. Um, so, the, and, and looking at uh, uh, courts, in the cases in the European Court of Human Rights, looking in the uh, um, Courts of Justice of the European Union, um, one of the cases about Romanian priests, for example, are they allowed to organize uh, in a trade union? Um, not terribly helpful for most practical considerations. Um, and also looking at the wording of the relevant independent labor organization, ILO conventions to which the UK had, had signed up. So um, the Court of Appeal found itself looking at the wording of the ILO convention and said, well, looking at that, looking at this Romanian priest case, then um, we think the question of um, uh, 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 substitution is really important and you're stuck with the findings of Judge Mary Stacey. You didn't appeal those, you couldn't appeal those at the time, so you're stuck with it. But the court said, had Uber been decided before the CAC looked at it, might have come out differently. But hey, we are we are now. Um, it's fair to say that uh, uh, reaction to this decision um, has been, um, how can I put this? Uh, well, Alan Bogg, Professor of Employment Law at Bristol University. Um, this is how he put it on Twitter. Uh, what is parochial is there's an occasional use of substitutes by a few riders by the way, with a substitution clause introduced after the application for trade union recognition, has effectively blocked access to a basic protections from trade union victimization in an entire company. Can this be right? Well, other commentators have weighed in um, about what they see as the fetishization of substitution rights. And that as long ago as 1967, which is where this page is taken from. I should have read this at university. I might have read it at university. I don't remember. That's why I have nightmares about my finals. But this is taken from, from 1967. And it's the, it's, the, it's the bit at the bottom that I think is really interesting. Um, it's by an eminent uh, 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 lawyer. Um, um, uh, you know, a gardener is not, it seems, entitled to delegate the entire work to somebody else. And that... You know, that's right, isn't it? If you, it, it? Just because you occasionally substitute somebody doesn't mean that the fundamental relationship isn't with you. You, know, you don't hire riders as, 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 as employment agencies in their own right. 
you hire them as riders. You would expect to have your primary relationship with the rider. The substitution clause, uh, it might be occasionally used. It was never used in Pimlico Plumbers. It is occasionally used in Deliveroo. But does that really change the whole nature of the relationship? As long ago as 1967, you see a little footnote at the bottom. Footnotes are always interested. This has been treated as merely one factor, though an important one amongst the many to be considered. Exactly so. Substitution shouldn't be a, a, a magic get out clause. And that's why I said when we were talking about the practical implications of all of this, that I think that um, uh, for now, if you have a substitution clause and it's actually used, that is, as the law stands, probably enough to remove providers of labour services, drivers, couriers, etc., from worker status. But I don't see that lasting. I don't see that lasting. Um, it, judges aren't really sheepish. It's not how they write. But but you, you could imagine that Lord Justice Underhill, who said, you know, actually, I think it would be a good idea for these workers to organise. Actually said it in the judgment. You know, he's doing what he's doing because he's a classic common lawyer constrained by authority. But that is not the direction of travel which is why I don't think substitution clauses have much of a life for much longer. So um, thank you for bearing with me um, during my own personal nightmares. Um, thank you for bearing with me during the uh, discussion of the, the, the background law, which I do think helps illuminate the practical situation that we find ourselves in. Um, Jane, are there any questions which I haven't picked up already as we've gone along? There are some questions. There's um, quite a specific one in the chat, which is, um, can you let us know which statute expressly prohibits contracting out of a legal right fee? Um, and of course, there are a few of those, aren't there? Uh, yes. Um, uh, and depends which legal right. <laughs> I mean, sorry, I hate using the word depends. Uh, which legal right we're talking about. But there is a general prohibition um, in the Employment Rights Act. And I can't for the life of me remember which section it is now. Uh, section um, 203, isn't it, in the Employment Rights Act? Um, which says uh, that you can't contract out of the provisions of this Act. And there's similar provisions in the Equality, Equality. Act. Yeah. Um, and that's hence, of course, the need for a settlement agreement process if you're settling disputes arising out of your statutory employment rights, because you can't contract out of them unless you go through the settlement agreement process. Um, and there's another one, um, given everything that you, you've said and the definition that you took us to, uh, do you think we need, and I guess the second question is, will we get um, a new statutory definition of what's an employee, employee what's a worker, what's a self-employed? Um, we might. Uh, we know that the Law Commission are thinking about this. They haven't yet published their next programme of work. They're asking for views as to what should go into their next programme of work. Um, there are some employment lawyers, there are a lot of accountants who think that life would be so much easier with a clear statutory definition. Um, I think life would be easier in the sense it would be a lot easier for Jane and me to make money if we have a statutory definition because, because we'll be gaming it as soon as it comes out. The, the, the advantage of the lack of clarity that you might say at the moment is that it is actually a lot harder to game. And, and post Uber, it really is much harder to game. You're, you're, you're looking at this in a very different way. So I'm personally not convinced that a new statutory definition would be helpful at all. No. Um, but uh, I, I suspect that there are a lot of people out there who think that there is a clarity to be had. We will keep finding ingenious ways of working. As I said, when, when I was looking at this stuff um, in 1988, who'd ever heard of an app? Yeah, and I guess um, what might be more useful uh, would be going back to what you were saying about Uber. It was really about national insurance savings, etc., and uh, who bears the tax. Uh, what would be really useful is not to have different tests for tax and employment. That would be more useful in practice, wouldn't it? Um, I, I was, I was going to nod vigorously in agreement right up until the last moment. I thought what you were going to say was we need to reform our whole system of labour tax. 
Oh, well, so that, so that we, we, we actually start to harmonise the tax rates between employed and self-employed. It shouldn't make any difference to what tax you pay. Um, there is this, like, like with road tax, you know, there's an idea, I pay my road tax, therefore I can run over cyclists. Um, that's not what road tax is about. You're not paying for the roads as such. It's, it's a charge on the emissions of your vehicle. And it's, it's like that with national insurance contributions. It's not, you don't buy employment rights with national insurance anymore. It's just a tax. It's basically a wheeze. Um, and national insurance rates shot up under the last Labour government so that they could say, oh, we haven't increased income tax. No, you've increased national insurance massively. Um, you know, why are we taxing Labour so heavily? That's what I think we ought to do. I'm, I, I, I think it's about tax harmonisation is the, is, is, is the way to go to make a difference to all of this. And I think a lot of the problems will fall away. Mm. OK, um, so... It's now 11.40. If we didn't manage to get to your question, we will come back separately afterwards, of course. Um, but otherwise, thank you, Jonathan, for that. Thank you to everybody for dialing in. As I said at the start, there will be a questionnaire that comes around afterwards by email. It only takes a couple of minutes to fill it in, but we'd be really grateful if you would. It will help us uh, shape future sessions. We do already have one in mind for um, when everybody's back from summer holidays in September. We're planning a session on uh, handling absence management. So there'll be more um, on that to follow. But otherwise, thank you very much for dialing in. Have a good day and, uh, and a good summer, whether you're home or away. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.